Wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a great, great day for me to uh, experience these wonderful conversations and uh, get so much uh, food for thought on the topic that I'm researching on. I think we all agree that robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence are at the core of innovation. They will tremendously change the way that we interact, the way we live in the future of work, the future of health, and the future of mobility. We will have a society of networks of humans and machines interconnected, learning from each other, assisting each other, and being in the best of uh, the foreseeable worlds, uh, one unity that, does the, uh, that uh, solves the major challenges and uh, enables us to do the moonshots we are talking about. We all were puzzled by the result in 2016 when Lee Sedol was beaten by uh, Google DeepMind in the, uh, the uh, game Go. I think we all were kind of intrigued by the fact that in none of the games he even stood a chance to the machine. However, if you look at this picture, it's kind of interesting that the machine is cal calculating the moves. However, if it comes to the fact of executing these moves in the real world, there seems to be some flaw in the game. Because we should ask ourselves, who the hell is the person on the left side? <laughs> So I guess we all agree this is not a robot, this is not an artificial intelligence. It is a human that grasps the objects, moves them according to the plan of the artificial intelligence, and relieves them. And in 1997, I already had this uh, uh, picture in front of me, and it was Gary Kasparov playing against Deep Blue. Google was, Deep, uh, Google was IBM back then, and uh, interestingly, the same picture applies. So immediately, I guess you all know what's coming, who the hell is the person on the right side? <laughs> I guess we all agree that it cannot be that within 20 years of research, the only thing that we achieved was moving a person from left to right. So there needs to be more. <laughs> so the physical interaction with the world seems to be a tremendous challenge. So intelligence that goes beyond the pure computation seems to be something wonderful and inspiring, and we have to look at the humans. So I typically do experiments with my children to understand how artificial intelligence in the real world can, can work. Like I have three, that's almost statistics. Let's see where this is going. So uh, I had a couple of years the idea of How can we actually enable robots to learn and manipulate with the real world? And I had problems in understanding this uh, fundamental challenge in robotics and machine intelligence. And um, I had the, the, the luck that in, uh, my, my little daughter back then, four years old, was making a mess in our living room, and I thought, oh, that's a chance. So um, please come here. <clears throat> If you can um, take the key, open the lock, within less than 10 trials, you don't have to clean up. So incentive was set. Um, and she was able, within seven trials, to open the door. So to insert the key, open the door. However, it took her four years of growing and seven trials during that experiment. So there seems to be a tremendous challenge in making physical systems intelligent. And if we come at the same, at the same time, 2015, at the DARPA Robotics Challenge, this is what physical intelligence in robotics was looking like. So we are by far not there what humans could do, even a four-year-old daughter of a, a robotics researcher. And I just want to give you an analogy why this manipulation problem, this interaction with the world, this grasping is so complex. It's simply because if you think about the concepts of mobility versus manipulation, going from A to B, we all did microscopy in the, in the high school, so any amoeba can do that, right? So autonomous driving, going from A to B, seems from an evolutionary standpoint a very basic skill because any living organism can essentially move from A to B. However, if it comes to the manipulation, to grasping, to interacting with the world, shaping it, and using the tool, the wonderful tool hand, to create new tools to change the world that we live in, and according to, to, uh, to, the, to the concept of manipulation, this seems to be something that only primates are there for. So what is the, inter the, uh, the difference between an AI with a body and an AI without a body? Let me explain you on this very basic example. So if you think about a disembodied AI, we have a data receiver and sender, and we've got an AI algorithm, That essentially means that we receive data, we throughput it to the AI algorithm, we do an analysis in the cloud foreseeable, and then send back the information that uh, was requested by the receiver. We all know this from the uh, personal assistants that we can buy nowadays, right? So we get speech being recorded by the microphone, sent into the AI uh, cloud, and then getting the uh, actual response that obviously serves our demands. However, if we go to physical interaction, so the embodiment problem, then we have a sensory motor uh, body that is not only exchanging data and information in a sequential manner, but it interacts with the world via action, so the world acts on the system via data and energy, and energy. And it responds with a reaction via data and energy. 
This means there is a coupled process that is fundamentally induced by the laws of physics, so inducing coupled interaction between the sensory motor body and the world, which in turn also needs the interaction between the AI algorithm and the body in a fully coupled process. So this is a very complex thing that has to be treated and it is fundamentally more complex than purely sequential processes in disembodied AI. So this actually um, is a very interesting problem to look at, especially if you look at the, the question, how do these optimal bodies look like? How should I build a body that actually fulfills all these desires to interact intelligently and manipulate the world? And this is why robotics is such an interesting topic in artificial intelligence because it's about the creation of embodied intelligence that is able to interact with the world, manipulate and exactly solve these issues I was talking about. However, if it comes to robotics, we all know the discussions are not far away. Robots take away our jobs. The Spiegel, the famous Spiegel magazine, is uh, iterating on this uh, several decades. We see this uh, <coughs> seems to be a reoccurring discussion um, and obviously there has been some substitution, especially in the 80s, if we look at the industrial robots that are in the, in the uh, manufacturing sites of the big automobile uh, car manufacturers. So these are machines, however, that are truly not embodied artificial intelligence. They are pure machines that move according to a software program that is pre-programmed and then it's just an execution. There is no true interaction. So what does it need to be embodied AI? And I think it's kind of very clear. You need a sense of touch. <coughs> And with a sense of touch, you can move the robot around and you can show it certain things. So with this sense of touch, obviously, I can show Franka, the robot you see here, how to do certain things. And I can essentially use it to give it one thing, the ability to learn. And this ability to learn, you see here in this example. So the robot is now Franka in our lab and Franka is learning how to insert a peg into the hole with just a very small computer in order to learn this manipulation task within a manner of four to five minutes. So this skill is essentially such that um, the robot is able to experience from, from um, manipulation with the world how to do this in a correct manner. And in the end, after only four to five minutes, instead of four years of growing up and seven trials as my little daughter, the robot is able with closed eyes to beat all my PhD students. And they are not all computer scientists. They are computer scientists, they are electric engineers, and they are mechanical engineers as well. So they have certain skills, right? Mechanical skills. So in the end, it was kind of astonishing that we could, in a sense, beat these grown-ups. We have human-level physical intelligence in manipulation. However, now we could ask one more question. So what happens if we don't only have one robot, but what happens if we have many robots that are interconnected with each other? So what we see here now is a live feed if you could stop it yeah. is a live feed <coughs> to Hannover, to Garmisch Partenkirchen and to Munich. And we are connecting the robots via the internet. So we have Franka here connected to all these other robots. And we can now basically operate this robot via standard internet. So this is a live demonstration where I now will take one robot and let's connect it to Garmisch-Partenkirchen, which is the upper right system. So I can now basically use my sense of touch here and interact, which you see in the upper right. No? Ah, it's the one in the Munich. Okay, so here you can see now entire Munich. <laughs> interacting with me, so I'm enslaving the collective in Munich with my robot from here. So, Berlin rules Munich in this case. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> so now, there is a fundamental question we might ask. What happens if we want to learn this key into the whole, <clears throat> not within minutes, but maybe within seconds? Can we actually connect these robots such and let them learn in a collective that the keyhole problem that usually takes four years for a kid to do just can be done within 40 seconds. Let's see whether this works. Let's go. So what you see now is that the robots in Hanover, in Garmisch-Partenkirchen and in Munich are trying to do this key into the whole problem simultaneously, exchanging information over the internet all the time and therefore basically getting an avalanche effect which you see here in this collective intelligence where success 
and unsuccessful trials are being collected and distributed all the time. And only after three trials, we will see if we send back the information from the cloud to Franca that you see here, it will be able to execute exactly that task. So let's do that. Let's see whether Franca is able to do it. That has been a newborn robot that for the first time has inserted a key into the hole without ever having done and learned that before. Thank you, Franca. So what is this, what we have just witnessed? This is a new effect about generalization ability, networked systems, and collectivity changing the way that learning can be accelerated. So this is a fundamental question about knowledge increase. Can the collective be used to achieve in a state of knowledge in an accelerated way? And how can the network be used as an infrastructure to essentially have a collective interacting instantaneously, exchanging knowledge, and therefore tremendously increasing yeah, the knowledge, uh, the, the problem-solving um, abilities of the overall system. Let me explain you this with some analogies and some new results that we have just achieved and developed a new theory that actually explains not only the learning, but how collective learning can really be used in real physical systems. So if we look at single isolated uh, beings that cannot learn or generalize, then they basically learn and forget. So now let's assume that this most basic system is supposed to learn or to achieve 10 to the power of five tasks, meaning this is 100%. Then obviously, because the system learns and forgets all the time, it will need linear amounts of time to execute, right? I think that's obvious. So if we have 10, uh, 100,000 tasks, and let's assume one task needs an hour. The single uh, system needs 100,000 hours to execute. If we now get into the ability of machine learning, so let's give the system the ability to learn like we humans can do, then there is a tipping point. So in the beginning, there is some exploration, knowledge acquisition, and then very quickly, we kind of are able to execute all the tasks in a very a short amount of time because the experience helps us to get this time down. I think this is what we all know, and we are looking for machine learning algorithms. It has been one of the tremendous challenges over la the last 10, 15 years to actually enable robots to do these tasks. However, let's go a bit closer to what we see here. There you can see this tipping point. What happens if we put together many of these agents, however, separated by walls that forbid the communication, the exchange of knowledge. You would all ex uh, kind of experience or expect, probably, that there is a tremendous speed increase. This is kind of what we call parallelity. That's the basis also of modern deep learning algorithms. However, it's kind of interesting that there is not a phase shift that we can observe. And why? Because there's one thing missing. They're not exchanging and sharing the knowledge to actually get to this tremendous speed increase you just saw, going from years to minutes to seconds to do a task that evolution took billions of years. And this is exactly what we have to do. In order to incorporate this knowledge exchange in the collective, we actually reach a second tipping point. And if we show this, not only in a linear scale, but in logarithmic scale, we will see that now we have found two fundamental um, effects that change the way that we can acquire knowledge. The single organism that just does, you know, the same thing over and over again, it never learns, it does, for everything it needs just the maximum amount of time. Then there's obviously the polymath that needs a lot of time to uh, reach the state of wisdom to be able to learn and to execute these things, and at some point it is so wise that everything takes only a minimum amount of time. However, there is now a second tremendous uh, shift in, uh, or increase in uh, learning abilities, which is the collective that is two to three orders of magnitude faster than the polymath in this example. So in summary, we have torn down two walls towards collective intelligence. The embodiments that have a sense of touch needed to be developed to be able to interact with the world in order to really have embodied artificial <coughs> intelligence. And the second was to enable learning, transfer of knowledge, and knowledge sharing in order to truly tear down the wall to collective learning. Thank you very much. <laughs>